set up the technology. <laughs> this morning, Flint still does not have clean drinking water. That is real. This morning, Puerto Rico still has not been rebuilt. That is real. This morning, hundreds of migrant children separated from their parents by our government remain imprisoned by our government. That is real. In a way, each of these things is a success of white supremacy. And in a way, each of these things is a failure. A failure of humanity, a failure of faith, failure of empathy, and a failure of imagination. And so this morning, I'm going to talk about imagination. But when I talk about imagination, please know that I'm not, I don't mean imagination in the sense that we often think of it. We often think of imagination as something sappy and silly, as something childish in the most patronizing and condescending sense of the word. I'm not talking about imagination as daydreaming. I'm not talking about imagination as if it's something utterly distinct from and divorced from and subordinate to reality. Because I believe that we do not appreciate the ways in which imagination and the limits of imagination, and dare I say the failures of imagination, create so much of what it is that we take to be real. Let me try to describe what I'm talking about by way of a story. As a child, we had a map in our house, one of those National Geographic geopolitical maps of the world. It hung in our kitchen, and for some reason, I loved this map. I found it endlessly fascinating, and looking at it, it must have seared into my mind. On this map, different countries were represented by different colors. The United States was green, Canada was this orange blob, and the Soviet Union, predictably, was pink. So powerful was this map that I came to associate permanently different countries with different colors in my mind, such that even today, if you were to yell out a country of the world, I would associate that country first with either pink, orange, yellow, green, or purple. And the same for each state in the United States, because we also had a geopolitical map of the United States. So as a child, I was confused the first time we drove as a family from one state to another. <laughs> and I demanded to know, where is the line? I fully expected that there would be a line, a boundary, something existing to separate this from that. And to tell you the truth, I fully expected that this line of demarcation would be tinted green on one side and orange on the other. Instead, there was only woods with pine trees and rocks here, and more woods with pine trees and rocks there. Where is the line, I demanded from my parents, who told me, after figuring out what I was talking about, <laughs> that no line exists, that it is imaginary. Can I share a couple of radical thoughts with you? What if I were to tell you that all borders are imaginary? Which is not to say that they do not exist, which is not to say that they are not real, but it is to say that they exist only because we imagine that they do. That they are real only because we imagine that they are. Their existence is contingent on our imagination, on the limits of our imagination, and on the failures of our imagination. 
citizenship is imaginary as well. It only exists because we imagine that it does because of the limits of and failures of our imagination. What if I were to tell you, like Marilyn Robinson says in her essay, that money and debt are imaginary? Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that they are not real. They are real and they exist, but they only really exist because we imagine that they exist. And I could go on. What if I were to tell you that race is imaginary? Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that race is not real, only that it became real because people imagined that it was real. How do you all feel about these ideas? Troubled, puzzled, discomforted, angry? But I would remind you that we all just heard, we all just listened to a song in which Eric and Maria sang, Imagine There's No Countries, It Isn't Hard to Do, Imagine No Possessions, Imagine All the People Sharing All the World. That is, in fact, what we just sang. In fact, Glenn chose this piece of music without even consulting me. Imagine that. <laughs> what I'm asking you to consider today is that the lyrics to Imagine by John Lennon, all the things that we're asked to reimagine, we're being asked to reimagine them because they are, in some way, failures of imagination in the first place. That is my first point this morning. There are a lot of things that exist and that are real, but that are also imaginary. There are a lot of things that exist that are also failures of the imagination. One could make a lengthy list of failures of imagination that have shaped and continue to shape our world. The definition of African Americans as three-fifths of a person in our nation's constitution comes to mind or the denial of the franchise to vote based on race, or gender, or wealth, or photo identification, caste systems, the belief that women could not do all sorts of things, everything from science to sports, the belief in the gender binary as a whole, we could make a very, very long list of failures of imagination. But I also want to be clear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that imagination exists in an individualistic way. It will probably not work for you well if you go to a store after the service today and tell the person at the cash register that money is imaginary. It will probably not work if you call the bank and tell them that your student loans are imaginary. It will probably not work if you try to cross a border and say that borders are imaginary. I just want to make sure we're clear on that. And the reason that doing these things won't work is not because you as an individual are bad at imagining. It is because the type of imagination I am talking about this morning is collective rather than individualistic. Let me be clear, I'm also not talking about a way of thinking that says we just imagine our own reality, or that our thoughts become reality. There are some spiritual traditions that tell us that if we can only change our thoughts, that it will change our reality, and I don't actually believe this. There's several problems with this. It's problematic because it places blame on people who suffer with illness or poverty or bad luck. It leads us to say to them, oh, if that, that person just had better thoughts, they wouldn't be in this bad place. And I find that way of thinking cruel and untrue. But this thought that, that what we think as individuals shapes our reality is problematic again because it is incredibly individualistic. What I'm talking about this morning are social realities. Which is not to say that as individuals we do not need to work on our own individual imagining or our failures of imagination. There's a famous story from many years ago that's told if you if you know the ending of it, don't 
give it away. The story goes like this. A boy and his father are out driving on a highway. The father loses control of the car and it crashes. The father is killed instantaneously. The boy suffers life-threatening injuries and is taken to the hospital, rushed into surgery. The surgeon rushes in, looks down, and says, I cannot operate on this boy. This boy is my son. That story from many years ago is confusing, only if you fail to imagine that the surgeon could be the boy's mother. Right? Who's who heard that story? Wow, okay. Should have come up with a better story. <laughs> or the more contemporary version of the story is that we could imagine that the boy has two fathers. So we do need to, I think that story was first told in like the, the 50s or the 60s. So we do need to work on failures of the imagination. But what I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is talk about imagination, the type of social imagination that we're called to cultivate. There's a passage, a hard passage from Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, in which Baby Suggs offers a sermon to the community of African Americans who have escaped from slavery. Her sermon is described this way, and we read some of it. She did not tell them to clean up their lives and go and sin no more. She did not tell them they were the blessed of the earth. It's inheriting me or its glory and impure. She told them that the only grace they could have was the grace they could imagine. That if they could not see it, they would not have it. I love this powerful passage. What the speaker is saying is that the categories, often the categories that we've been given to make sense of our existence don't make sense the categories we've been given are in some ways limiting or restrictive, that new understanding is needed. That the way forward, that the way forward to grace is through the power of our imagination. It is a radical and liberating message. Theologian Reinhold Niebuhr wrote of the importance of religious imagination. He wrote, quote, people without imagination really have no right to write about ultimate things. Here I believe that what Niebuhr is saying is that religion, that religious thought can do one of two things. When it lacks imagination, all it can do is reinforce the way that things are and defend the status quo. There's a lot of religion that does that. A lot of bad religion that does that. Religion without imagination protects the status quo, praises the powerful, criticizes the powerless, and becomes a chaplain to empire. There's a lot of religion that does this. A century and a half ago, preachers without imagination defended the status quo of slavery. And today, the exact same verses are used to justify all of the latest forms of atrocity. But Niebuhr says that imagination, the very ability to imagine, is the basis for mature and responsible religious and ethical thought. People without imagination really have no right to write about ultimate things. The ancient biblical tradition reminds us of this potential for imagination. The text that Eric read this morning came from the book of Leviticus. Say what you will about Leviticus, but that passage, that passage is challenging. It fits within the thrust of the whole of Scripture which is very much unconcerned with individual conduct, but immensely concerned with social arrangements and what we call social justice. In judging upon the sheer number of the texts, the thrust of the whole scripture is that it is very, very concerned with economic justice. And so in the midst of Leviticus 25, we find this idea of jubilee, And in Jubilee, here is what it is said. After a Sabbath of Sabbaths, after seven Sabbaths, you're to have a year where 
nothing is planted and nothing is harvested, where all that we consume, we just consume from the earth. In that year, all debts will be forgiven and renounced. All property which has been transferred will be retransferred. All possessions will be redistributed. And if today we're unable to imagine it, it may be that the text is not the problem. The problem might be our own failure of imagination. Which brings us to the second reading, Marilyn Robinson, where she begins. She begins her essay by calling to mind a picture, an image taken of the planet Mercury. The planet Mercury is very, very hot and very, very desolate. So hit by asteroids and stuff that it's the only planet in our solar system that lacks any atmosphere. That's how desolate it is. And then she mentions an interesting thing, that all of the features, the craters and valleys and mountains and everything you find on the sur surface of Mercury has been given by scientists the name of classic composers who they love. That we see Beethoven, Bach, and classic artists, Monet, Renoir, every, every picture, every, every part the surface of Mercury has been renamed after, after somebody created. And Marilyn Robinson takes that and she sort of she sort of wonders what is given and what is absolutely created. She concludes with a number of thoughts. She says, in the end, there is no value but what we value. That our wealth is finally neither more nor less than human well-being. She says that there is at present a dearth of humane imagination for the integrity and mystery of other lives. And she says that this world, this universe, in which there was no life before us and no life after. that all that we create is what we imagine. And if we imagine a scarcity or a lack or a debt, that only debt is to ourselves. That's what you get when you send me away on summer vacation and have some good thoughts. Make some deep thoughts. It's good to be back. Amen. Let's it be, and let us sing together. Um, let's uh, sing together 118. Um, and I invite you to, uh, in the in the great hymnal, I invite you to rise in body, form, and spirit as we sing.